welcome everyone to uh, to this workshop which is empathetically define and rigorously measure the customer value you deliver by deepa and kavita just to give you a brief introduction about deepa deepa is a co-founder and ceo of pencer design and kavita is head of research uh, with pencer design so without further delay uh, over to you deepa and kavita hi everyone and thank you vishal um, okay, we're thrilled to be with you today and spend uh, 90 odd minutes with you, um, walking you through everything we know about um, defining and actively measuring uh, customer value. Uh, we would love for this to be interactive, so please do put in your questions, comments, thoughts, we'll incorporate that throughout the talk. So just as a quick introduction and to give you a little more sense as to um, who we are, Pensar Design is a design strategy and an innovation consulting firm. And we actually help our clients, um, large conglomerates, small startups to solve their customer problems. That's really what we're all about. And today we're gonna to be talking about empathetically define and rigorously measure the value you deliver to your customers. Um, Vishal already quickly introduced us, but um, my name is Deepa Bachu and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pensar Design. If you can go to the next slide, Kavi. Yeah. Um, I have a background in engineering, product management, design, um, and I've worked in the industry for about 25 years. Um, Kavi, if you can introduce yourself by going back yeah. to the introduction slide, please. I will, yeah. I uh, also wanted to add that what Deepa won't tell you and possibly missed out on telling you was about uh, was the fact that some of her work has uh, previous work um, has been published as a Harvard business case study and uh, also in the as an HBR article and more recently as an organization also we've had some of our, our design thinking work published in uh, as a HBR article. So a lot of our work around um, behavioral science, and uh, building products is what uh, Deepa failed to mention, but that's also part of her uh, background. And about me, I'm the head of research at Pensar Design. Um, and what we do again is of course, employ behavioral economics principles, but also qualitative research as part qualitative and quantitative. So we bring in mixed methods research uh, to be able to get to better outcomes at the end of the day with the companies that we solve for. As a broad introduction to the mindset or design thinking itself, um, Kavi, the slides are seem like a little bit out of order. Could you go to, thank you. Our approach is really anchored in design thinking. Um, we really believe in starting by understanding the customer's uh, needs and values and mindsets. So the first stage is discover where if you see in the illustration, there's an eye, there's a ear, there's a word thought bubble, but it's also a heart. And it's really about observing, listening, and empathizing with the customer. So the first stage, which is discover, it really involves knowing your customer better than they know themselves. The second stage is what we call insight which is about connecting the dots in interesting ways by completely savoring surprises. What did your customer do that completely surprised you? Looking at that, connecting the dots on the facts you have, whether through quant or qual, as Kavi was talking about earlier, and articulating aha insights, insights that really inspire innovation. Dream is the stage where you flex your muscles to go broad and try multiple ideas by building on each other's ideas as a team and narrowing to one that you believe will truly solve the customer problem. And finally, disrupt is having the humility to rapidly experiment your ideas before you possibly even write a single line of code. Now, I did uh, step through it like it was a linear process, and that's really far from the truth. It's a very, very iterative process. Sometimes you get dumped in dream and you have to find your way through the other stages, um, but it's an extremely iterative stage. The first two are ones where you're really falling in love with the problem. And the second two are ones where you have fallen in love with the problem, you know what the problem is, you know how customers are gonna measure success. And then you go about creating a solution 
that will solve those problems that you're setting out to solve. So as far as straight out services are concerned, we do customer research, we do every type of design there is. But the part that we enjoy the most is when we're able to collaborate with a client and help uh, solve problems together, do it with them. Um, what this helps us do is build that level of um, you know, responsibility and accountability with the employees, but also learn from them the domain. And we're, we won't be those consultants that tell them what they um, you know, already know, but consultants that work with them to discover new experiences. Um, so as far as straight out services are concerned, we do customer research, every type of design there is, and what we call the culture of innovation. This might look like a brag sheet of clients, but really the point I'm trying to make here is maybe there's a little bit of bragging there, but the point I'm really trying to make is that design thinking is really agnostic to uh, B2C, B2B, enterprise, consumer, um, you know, finance domain, autom autom automotive, it really doesn't matter whether you are a large, a small, or rich domain, um, design thinking is, means, is a means to the end. It's a process that helps you solve big gnarly problems or even small ones, and it doesn't matter which domain you're working in. The, um, the idea as well is that our global learning experiences shape our perspectives. And I think um, having worked across the globe, we also have a clearer view into understanding cultural contexts. Um, we look at um, you know, the, uh, the unsaid, and Kavi is going to go into it a little more about how you overcome your own unconscious biases and by giving ourselves a global canvas, I believe that we've gotten better and better at really understanding the cultural context and understanding why people do what they do, even if it sounds completely silly um, that the customer is doing what they are, we have the um, ability to put our judgment aside and really be thoughtful about, about deeply digging into why the customer is doing what they are. Our schedule is like, so we're going to spend, um, you know, I'm already done with the introduction. We're going to focus on empathetically defined. And then I'll talk, Kavi will talk us through unconscious biases. And then I'll talk to you about rigorously measuring. We'll share a case study with you. And then we'll go into actually working on it um, as, um, you know, as uh, experienced professionals, we learn most by doing. And we hope that this workshop gives you a chance to do that. Kavi? Yeah. Um, so like Deepa said, what we'll cover today uh, under empathetically define and rigorously measure are a few things. Um, we want to get into whether, how many of you are aware of your unconscious biases, right? And how often have you fallen in love with the solution that, uh, that's been built versus really staying with the problem and falling in love with the problem instead? Uh, so that's the part that we'll cover today. And under rigorously measure, there'll be two questions that we'll hopefully uh, surface up for you, which is what is the benefit your solution is delivering to your end users? Um, and what is the time really? How quickly uh, are we realizing this value for the customer? So we've, right now we're getting into empathetically defined, right? What is empathy or what is it to discover? So tying empathy back to discovery. Discovery is really all about understanding customer problems and their underlying unmet needs. Uh, it's, it's about truly being curious about what your customers want, what they need, and listening to them and empathizing with them. The way we go about discovering is two ways. It starts with primary research and primary research involves connecting with your customers directly and hearing what they have to say or seeing what they do today. Whereas secondary research, of course, I don't need to explain this in too much detail. You know what that is. That is looking out for trends, looking out for competition, who's already doing this, looking for data that kind of, um, you know, backs up some of the challenges that you might have or the topic that you want to research itself. 
while primary research and secondary research are pretty much uh, the best ways to go about doing uh, discovering an unmet need or a real problem, it's something that we want you all to be aware of because as an organization that uh, does a lot of qualitative research, here's something that all of us uh, need to keep in mind, right? Um, what does it really to empathetically define? First, there are two things. First is the first principles thinking. And the reason I'm uh, talking about first principles thinking here is first principles thinking talks about breaking things down to the fundamental truth, right? And then reasoning up from there. It's a very physics way of thinking about the world. So bring everything down to its bare minimum and then see what and how you can reason up from this. So it's about freeing ourselves from every assumption and what does, and what does that mean? So often what happens is um, we run into, the, into this habit of just being uh, assuming, assuming certain things will work a certain way because we're always very close to the problem, right? As a company, as an industry, when you work in a particular domain or industry, being very close to the problem also clouds our judgment in many ways because assumptions or biases start to creep in. Uh, and what happens is we tend to lead with those biases. Um, the first principle is thinking kind of forces us to break away from those assumptions or biases. And what really are unconscious, what are these biases that I talk about? These unconscious biases are perceptions about customers, perceptions about users that is heavily influenced by what you know and feel, which is being too close to the problem, right? Uh, they're often unsupported judgments or opinions. How do you then convert that into conscious understanding? You can convert your unconscious biases to conscious understanding by conducting, like I said, interviews with your customers. And these are not just conversations, but truly understanding the ecosystem in which they function. So it's not just having these questions that you want answered, but really seeing how they perform, go about performing their daily activities, functions within that ecosystem that they live in, and truly be curious and acquire new and deep knowledge. Right? So what is confirmation bias? Uh, you know, often a lot of us, even with the best of intention and wanting to understand what the customer wants to say and what they, what truly pains them, confirmation bias tends to creep in. And this is something that can be a very subconscious um, bias. So it's important to be aware of it. Uh, so if, if you look at the image, it's very clear, you know, there are objective facts and then there's um, what confirms your belief. Um, and what you see is really your confirmation bias. You already have an assumption and you're only seeing that narrow part of the entire picture. What you can do, some ways uh, to avoid these, uh, the confirmation bias and to truly empathetically define the problem is we ask you to begin live interactions with your customers. Uh, what that means is to strike up a conversation, right? Um, it's interesting. So often when you're in a new country um, and as a tourist, you have this very curious mindset. You're very excited. You're very aware of your surroundings. You want to talk to people. You want to learn new things about, your, about the environment that you're in. So we ask you to generally kind of go in with that mindset itself. So strike up a conversation. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, in general, people really like talking about themselves. So uh, you will see that even in instances where we've gone out to do research around personal finance management, which is a very sensitive topic, uh, you would think that people do, wouldn't want to talk about it. And we went prepared into that conversation with tools to be able to do that. However, as simple as kind of building that um, familiarity with them and then diving into the question, really people didn't have any trouble at all. But to do that, you also need to be curious show that you're interested in them, ask them open-ended questions, right? Show them that you're truly listening at the end of the day. And how do you do that? Um, paraphrase what they're saying, which means they know you're listening, you, they know um, what your understanding is also in line with what they're saying, but also savor surprises. If there's something surprising that comes up in the conversation, dwell on that a little bit. 
ask follow-up questions. And finally, observe, because uh, like we said earlier, as much as um, people, people have the best intentions uh, and they'll always talk in the form of intention, but we ask you to back that up with, by observing actual behavior, which really, which then translates to you having to be in their environment to be able to do that. Here's an interesting way of uh, going about it. Um, this is really, we're breaking this, bringing this back from something that we call the empathy map. The empathy map is a very straightforward um, matrix. And in the four quadrants, it's, it's almost like a template that you can use when you go out to, do, to talk to your customers, right? Understand what they're saying. What I say is, this is from the cu customer perspective, you're listening to what they have to say. But not just that, you're backing that up with observing what they do. And constantly during your conversations and trying to understand your customers, what you also want to do is infer from what you're hearing and seeing. So constantly think about what they are thinking and what they are feeling at the end of the day. What is that emotion that they're connecting with, the pain that they have, with the activity that they're doing? Because that really helps you then define the problem in the best way possible and make it as actionable at the end of the day in how you want to solve it. We've, we've covered this. So um, when we talk about stepping out of your comfort zone and being curious, go to their environment because the value you derive from observing them in their environment is very different from just having a bunch of questions that you want answered. And make sure you're listening, make sure you're observing for reactions, for behavior. Another example of what, uh, and just to kind of summarize what confirmation bias would be, um, you know, here's typically what a conversation would look like. Uh, you have a great idea, and I'm sure a lot of you will, will resonate with this because at some point in our lives, we've done this, right? Uh, we have a great idea, and we think it's fabulous. We head to the customer to gather feedback. You ask your customer, have you ever considered doing action X through app Y? And the customer, because he's aware that you are looking for a, val a validation of some sort, right? You're putting him in a tough spot when you ask him, have you, you know, would you do this? And the customer only to be nice would respond saying, yes, I would absolutely love to, right? So what are you getting at the end of the day? Validation, but that's not really a true test of behavior. You think you've hit the jackpot, you go back, your evidence, you think you've got the validation, and then the, you go about implementing uh, that particular feature in a product or a service. Uh, but ultimately what happens is um, the product or the service starts to fail. It does not, it's not really a great market fit, right? Um, and, and that happens often. A great way to avoid this is, of course, to always look for actual behavior and finally define your problem based on observed behavior and, um, and you know, qualitative inputs from conversations. We've seen that experiments have shown people provide tests or questions that are designed to yield yes or yes, uh, if their favored hypothesis was true. People usually ignore alternative hypotheses that are likely to give the same results, right? Um, because the tendency is to confirm what you believe. An example here, as you see, is if you were to search, is New York better than San Francisco? Because that is a leading question on Google. All you will get are sites listing the reasons why New York is better. And if you were to, do it to, if you were to do it the other way around, you will only see something that confirms that SF is better because that is essentially what you're trying to confirm. Um, so yeah, I mean, to summarize what we were talking about earlier, this is what confirmation bias is about and what you can truly do to avoid any of that is to go with an open mindset, go with a curious mindset, be um, observe what customers do, and take that into consideration when building out your solution and defining your problem itself. 
Thanks, Kavi. So, Chandan, you have a question to say if tourists, for example, have a confirmation bias, how do you overcome it? Or to use Venkat's term, Jemba, what happens if you sort of have Jemba and the confirmation bias? Um, so, as Kavi was talking about, even if you have a con confirmation bias, but you're truly um, looking at not only what they say, but what they do. And Kavi, if you can go back to slide 14, please. Um, you know, the, what they say and what they do is observed behavior. You're actually seeing it or you're hearing them say. But what you incite is on the right-hand side, what you believe they think and what you believe they feel. Um, so when you are truly building empathy, going through this and asking yourself the question, that's how you overcome the confirmation bias. So you don't, but the example that Kavi was talking about, you don't just go and you ask customers, hey, you know, are you likely to use this feature or functionality? You give, you run an experiment. You run an experiment to see what they do, what they prefer in real behavior. And uh, that's how you're able to overcome these confirmation biases. Yeah? And there's another question from uh, Venkat. You've also heard about functional fixedness as another pitfall. We, how do you guard yourself against that? Yeah, and um, oh, I think it's more a statement that whenever you get yourself there, it's good to be asking those open-ended questions. Absolutely, um, plus one on that. Great. Um, so let's, um, you know, we, we've introduced you to the idea of empathetically define, and now we want to move towards um, how do you then rigorously measure? What we'll talk about here is how do you measure a benefit? Now, the customer benefit is really the reason your customer chooses you, basically your solution, over competitive solutions. And how quickly do you allow your customers to realize that value itself? Now, in my experience of defining these values, they're really threefold. It either helps the benefits are about time, money, or frequency. Usually it's about saving time. When it's about money, it's either about saving money or making more money. And the third one around frequency is that it increases the frequency of something good happening and reduces the frequency of something bad happening. So really the value can be simply broken up into these three dimensions of time, money, and frequency. So um, if you wanted to get a closer look though, here is um, a larger value pyramid. Next slide, please. And Kavi, you might need to go on presentation mode because it's a little hard to see. Sure, I, I'll do that. The reason I did that was because it's, um, I think there's some issue, it gets stuck, which is why I moved into, yeah, this should be. Thank you. Um, so here is, um, I'm, I'm forgetting what the attribution is. I think this is BCG is my apologies, but um, I'm sure you'll be able to look at the elements of value and see. Um, this is from BCG of one of the large consulting firms where they talk about the functional elements like I spoke about with time, money, or frequency of good, bad. Then they talk about emotional, life-changing, and then ultimately self-transcendence, which is the huge social impact. So if you look at the functional ones, and I know that's really small for you all to see, but there are in the dimensions of time, money, and frequency, and even emotional is around the frequency, right? Increasing the chance of something good happening. So you all should certainly take a look at the elements of value and see which ones might be related to what you need. Now, Venkat, uh, it's not exactly Mas Maslow's hierarchy. Um, I think uh, more generally, yes. But I guess what, what I'm trying to say here is you want to look at that benefit um, to really understand how are you delivering that value through your solutions and, um, and hence, uh, how will you measure it? And it's actually not simple to measure, so I'll go into a little bit and give you examples of how to measure it as well. Um, I'm looking at a few questions here. Um, 
very interesting metrics to measure value. Would I be making the right conclusion if I say these are very B2C specific? So no, Narayan, um, the value, whether it's enterprise or um, B2C, it is really the same. I've worked, we worked with both enterprise as well as uh, consumer companies or even B2B companies. And it's just really similar. It's simply those three dimensions. Um, there might be some, um, you know, or a few um, products perhaps that um, it doesn't cover, but in my experience so far, um, it's usually time, money, and frequency. Those are the three elements. Um, value pyramid is awesome. Thank you, Chandan. We believe so too. Um, the other um, aspect, if you move to slide 20, please. Um, really what you want to do is look at what is the game creator? This is, the, uh, this is a really simple representation of the product market fit by Stratagen, a really good consulting firm. And they talk about, ultimately, you want to understand the customer pain and gain, which is on the right-hand side. And for each of the pains, you want to provide pain relievers. For each of the gains, you want to create um, you know, features and functionality that amplify that gain. So they talk about it as what is it that is a gain creator and what is it that you're creating that are pain relievers. And we find that even though there's the dimension of value of just um, you know, time, money, and frequency, if you look at the pain relievers, it's reducing the frequency of something bad happening. And if you look at gain creators, it's increasing the um, chance or frequency of something good happening. So whether you look at it in those three dimensions that we talked about of time, money, and value, or in the product market fit, we're basically going after the key functionality that helps increase gain or reduce pain for customers. So your customer value is not, you know, people are able to get to this functionality in three clicks. Your customer value is not that the uh, registration was simple your customer value is way beyond it. It's the reason that your customers choose you over competition. So I'd like to get into a few examples on the next slide, please. Um, but before we do that, I wanna do an activity. Um, so I'm gonna give you a scenario. Uh, Kavi and I have been talking for about 20 minutes straight and we think it's good for us to um, get some audience participation in. Um, so, um, you know, ClearTax, a really, really uh, sharp set of engineers. This uh, thing is not necessarily a clear ClearTax example, but think of it as any tax software. Um, now, what ClearTax does, or any tax software does, is uh, they help you calculate what you owe to the government at the end of the year, or what the government owes you because you've been one of the few people that have paid ahead of maybe even paid more and you need a refund. Um, there's a behavior globally where people actually pay ahead and expect a refund and that's almost their savings. Uh, they plan for that. So it's a way that they're hiding money away from themselves. So a lot of people actually focus on either the refund or look at how you can you know, pay minimum, right? So within legal constraints, you're looking at one, how do I maximize my refund? Or two, how do I reduce the money that I owe to the government? So these tax solutions are you know, simple software that help you answer questions so you can help determine the answers to both the questions that I mentioned. So um, a really smart group of engineers um, brought in a lot of efficiency. So you'll see the number on top. In this case, it's 6,563. That is the amount of money, for example, that you owe the government. A really smart group of engineers brought in a lot of efficiency and really sped up the refund calculation. How do you think customers reacted? I'd love to see your responses in the chat session. So again, it's tax software. That big number in the middle is the amount of refund 
or the amount you owe the government. The engineers got together and really sped up that number calculation instead of making it slow. How do you think customers reacted? So we see a couple of people saying pleasantly surprised, intrigued, maybe depends on what type of persona they are, mixed reaction. Okay, they will try to They'll drill down why they have to pay tax at all. Okay. <laughs> if they're looking to save time, they will like it. Interested. Okay. Let's hear a few more responses before I tell you the full story. Depends on other factors. How's the usability? Is it secure? Pradeep, let me try another app. Pradeep, <laughs> it's harrowing experience to do taxes once, let alone twice. <laughs> Gokul's talking about the amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> fraud. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is think about yourselves, right? Let's simplify this. Think about yourselves. Let's say that's at that number is actually the money you owe the government versus a refund. And the calculation happened really quickly. Put yourselves in those shoes, because we're all uh, people hopefully that pay taxes. So put yourself in those shoes and tell me what your reaction would be. Not about the amount, but just the, the speed with which that number is calculated. Now, Priya says she would recalculate. Sonia says she would validate, okay? Will amaze and plan better, okay? Pradeep says doubt the calculation. <laughs> yeah, Narayan, taxes are just simply painful no matter how you think about it. All right, thank you guys for your responses. Um, you know, taxes, it's one thing that um, nobody likes to do. And yet I used to be a part of Intuit and I'm so happy to say that we actually brought delight and joy because we gave people the confidence at Intuit through TurboTax that they were getting the maximum refund or they were paying the minimum amount of money. And the speeding up of calculation, like some of you said, would actually cause you to worry, would make you feel like, oh my God, they're not doing everything they possibly can to give me the best benefit. So this is where, um, where is the confirmation bias in the answer? Um, I don't know, that's, um, Chandan, I, I have to think about that one. It's a good question. I don't have a pat answer, but um, you know, ah, Actually, I do, Chandan. So the engineers, of course, thought the more efficient it can be, the more it'll save customers time. And so there was a confirmation bias, right? You ask people, hey, would you want to do your taxes fast? And of course, everyone would say yes. But the more important benefit was to increase the chance of getting every last deduction so that they have to pay the least amount of money or get the maximum amount of refund, whichever the case might be. And so the confirmation bias of speed, let's do it quickly, just really seeped in. Thanks Chandan for that question. And instead, what was important and a bigger value to customers was to maximize the refund, right? And so the fast calculation actually caused a lot of doubt, like Pradeep said or like Sonia said, or Priya said, that people wanted to recalculate it to just make sure that it took care of every last deduction that they had. So this is one where the value of a tax software, definitely you want it to be fast, but the main customer benefit is confidence 
that you are getting every last deduction that the software is actually working super hard to try to give you every last deduction that you can. More recently, we were creating a financial management software for um, you know, early jobbers as well as migrant labor. And we were trying to help them save money. We tried to speed through the registration process and customers actually said that they wanted it to take time. It needed to be painful because they felt then that they were in safe hands because people really cared about their information and were modeling the application so that it worked just right for them. So it's really important while save time is something everybody would want to do, it's important to sort of balance that uh, value then with others that customers might find more important. Um, next slide, please, Kavi. Okay, we're having that problem again. Yeah, I just seem to, every time I put it on presentation mode, it... No okay. issues. So let me, um, a few of you, even in the chat, asked for additional examples. Um, can we actually stay on the tax example itself for a second, please? Okay. If you think about Google, the Google search, could you please type in the chat what do you think the customer benefit is? Why do we use Google search? Breadth of search for information, right information, that time, instant suggestion. Because we don't like to search, is we use reliability. Speed. Quick answer for everything, crowdsourcing answers, access to information, appropriate results. Aggregation, okay, wonderful. So I'm actually gonna share something that we heard Larry and Sergey talk about in a really, really old video where they were talking about these custom benefits and Kavi, you can go to this slide. The, the main job is to find answers like many of you talked about. The result, the customer benefit was of course relevancy of the search results. If you got um, you know, completely irrelevant, oh yeah, Vikram, context-based answers, absolutely. Um, if the relevancy of the search was not, you know, um, accurate, then people, no matter how fast it was, wouldn't really use um, search. None of us would. The second one was to find answers quickly, right? So that was also important to find answers quickly but it was only second to getting relevant search results. So now how do you measure something like that? The measurement was for relevancy of search, they really looked at, they measured the time between the page display and the click. The faster you clicked, it meant the search was more relevant. So what they actually measured was that page display to click, how quick that was that was an indicator of relevancy. And if you think about it, that is just such a fabulous metric and such a creative way to measure the relevancy. Now, of course, the find answers quickly is a lot easier to measure. It's really time to display results, right? But the relevancy one is a real clever metric to look at time from page display to the first click. The faster you click, the more relevant the search was. So this is Google, you guys, and these um, customer benefits still are valuable. These measures are actively measured till today. Let's go to a different example. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and answer these for y'all. So with eBay, there's, it's a double-sided network, right? On one end, there's a consumer, and on the other end, there's a seller. What is the job the consumer is uh, employing eBay to do? It's purchase things that they might need. And from a seller perspective, they want to sell things that they don't need, right? And eBay basically connects the two. The customer benefit 
for the consumer is find stuff I'm looking for. Um, you know, you know, you go to eBay when you're looking for sort of strange or very specific things or things that are not just, you know, mass production. So the ratio of search to purchase is a really good metric to see if I actually found what I was looking for. Find authentic products. The metric was really seller authenticity and the rating that they gave. On the seller side, find buyers for my products. So again, percentage of inventory sold. I've put down like 20 things that are, are really unique. Um, how many things did I actually sell? Um, from a customer benefit, the seller wants to make sure that they don't get ripped off. And hence the number of genuine buyers on the site um, that are buying, completing transactions, paying for things is a metric that they're looking at. So again, you would see that the metric creation is in fact an art and really, really important to think through. It works whether you've got um, you know, a platform where it's, it's used by just consumers or it's a, um, you know, a double-sided platform like eBay. And let's go through one more example. Next slide, please. With Amazon. Um, so I'm sure all of us are consumers of Amazon. What are the customer benefits? And I realize that the font is really small here, you guys. My apologies. We just can't seem to get out of the um, you know, presentation mode. But um, Kavi is going to give that a try. Uh, the job is I, have, I basically uh, have what I need because I bought it on Amazon. And from a seller's perspective, they want to sell more items so that they can make more money. The benefit is that they have the product when they need it. The delivery speed is a metric. The best price. Constantly, Amazon is doing price comparison to make sure that their platform has the best price. Reliability. And it's the percentage of delivery promises kept. So you do know that Amazon actively measures these three things and they've stood the test of time over the 15 years or whatever Amazon has been around. Um, we care about getting it when we need it. So speed is important, price is important and getting it when they said that they would deliver it is really important. You may have heard that Amazon is already predicting what you're gonna buy before you even buy it. And that's because they wanna make sure that the reliability is there. On the seller side, they want to increase customer reach. So, you know, that's an easy metric, number of customers reached. Increased sales, they want to look at the number of orders fulfilled, as well as the percentage of returns. As you know, custom, uh, these platforms are doing a lot to help reduce the returns, the amount of shipping and handling, and the time that's wasted with people looking at things that they, they you know, didn't understand to be a certain type before they actually touched or saw it um, is really high. So percentage of returns is another metric that they're looking at. So you'll see here that uh, whether it's Google, eBay or Amazon and these sort of you know, very successful companies, the same customer value has stood the test of time. If you're an active Google user, which you know, who isn't, you'll see now that they are not just trying to give you a link to the answer, but help you get the answer itself. So for example, if you're boarding a flight and that's in your Gmail and you search that flight number, right away it gives you the status of the flight because you're not looking to go click on a relevant link, you're simply looking to find answers. So this is something that over a period of time, um, these companies have focused on and have really been on it. Yeah? How do we know what value is the right value to look at? Um, consumer might tell you something. Yeah. So this is really not about uh, asking the customer, do you value time over money? It's about what Kavita said earlier, about you know really see what they're doing, hear what they're saying, or listen to what they're saying, but also then connect with their belief system and their emotion, that's when you will be able to identify the right value. And besides, when you can't do that, or you haven't done that well, the way to do it is to rapidly experiment and you'll find out very, very quickly. Hopefully that answers your question, Chandan. Um, Next slide, please. 
I had the opportunity of um, working, at, like as I mentioned earlier, with Intuit. And one of the, the fabulous financial applications that they created was called Mint. And um, what Mint discovered, and Chandan, this may help uh, answer your question as well with an example. What Mint found was that, um, you know, you can use Mint, it's a global product, you can go put in your uh, transactions and it gives you a sense of where your money is going. The biggest question that most customers had was where is my money going and what is my net worth? There, they had a pie chart that, um, you know, you would see small images of it. They have a pie chart and people spent a lot of time on that pie chart because that answered the question of where the money is going. It basically split up, you know, the money that they've spent into categories. So the team actually actively measure time to pie. Like how quickly can we bring customers, even new customers to that pie chart so we can actively help them be engaged with the product and answer their question, where's my money going? So the team would very, very aggressively defend that. If somebody added um, you know, an extra question so that they could customize the app just right, they would make sure that the time to get that value would not be compromised. And that's something that the entire Mint team actively measured, the time to pie chart, right? So one, there is identifying the value. Two, then there's measuring it. And then three, there's the time to that value. You know, how many apps do you download and then you don't use and you just quickly uninstall? Because they simply didn't give you your value in the time that you wanted it to be seen, right? The one thing to be um, wary of is what I call vanity metrics, right? These are things that make you feel good. The number one vanity metric in my biggest pet peeve, um, and anyone who sort of talked to me about their um, you know, mobile app has heard a mouthful from me, is number of downloads. That is a vanity metric. It's a metric that makes you feel good. Just because somebody downloaded your app, it doesn't mean you're providing value. Look at DAU, look at MAU, whatever it is that, um, yeah, I think like active users, look at daily active, monthly active, weekly active, whatever makes sense to your app and focus on that. Now I'm not saying downloading is, a down, number of downloads is not important. You wanna make sure that there's the right awareness, it's probably a good metric for your marketing team. It's also probably a good metric to see how many people really care about solving a particular problem. Um, but it's not a good metric for value. Um, you know, growth comes from your customers using your product. Download is simply an indicator of interest. And hence, these vanity metrics are something that you have to be super, super careful about. Um, and thanks, Vikram. I love the uh, I love that terminology, vanity metrics too. Not something I coined, but something I've heavily borrowed. Um, you know, as product managers, if there are any product managers um, listening today, we always talk about you know three click access to this feature or functionality, and then you look at how many clicks it takes to get to that feature or functionality. Oh my God, that is so not important. That's not value at all. Yes, you want people to be able to access it, right? Much like I'm saying downloads is important, but the value, it trumps all of the other vanity metrics that you might be measuring. It's really important to look at that benefit or the value and then actively measure it. Um, I need to ask, what's the value from the session? What are the key takeaways for me to implement? <laughs> All right, I'm not sure if Chandan's being funny or insulting me, but I'll figure it out in a second. Um, okay, so um, let's get to the example. We want you to work on a particular um, exercise and see you know, sort of the um, metrics in, um, in use. 
So I'm going to just set it up for you. Kavi? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, you know, we've all been a part of redecoration. If you're a, if you're a young, it's your parents redecorating your house, maybe redecorating your room. If you're older, you've built a house or you've rented a new place. And redecoration, whether unwillingly or willingly, you've done at some part, some point of time in your life. So we've made up this company, Craft Co. Hopefully it doesn't exist is looking to cater to the needs of consumers wanting to design or redesign their homes. Now there's a whole host of people that you need to really go through large redesigns. Um, you know, you have the design itself, um, you know, the actual specs, architects or interior designers may help you, or perhaps you as a consumer step into that role. Then there are the workers, the contractors that actually do the job. These are carpenters, blacksmiths, polishers, painters, and so on and so forth. And then there are truth sellers, the retailers or wholesalers that you buy the material from, or your workers buy the material from. So we've just simplified it. There are people that design, they're the workers, and then they're the sellers. Now let's say Craft Co., a made up company, is looking to build technology or a marketplace that connects this ecosystem together. So that you have a sense of building empathy, we'll just talk you through what are some of the challenges on this two-sided network. For consumers like you or I, we're crippled by choice. There's so many designs, maybe some of us go on Pinterest and we've pinned a bunch of things, but we have complete lack of knowledge. We don't know when they say, First quality teak versus second quality teak. Man, does that even make a difference? Or should we just go with MDF or whatever else kind of wood they might have? And it's difficult finding people that they can trust to give them the right answers. And so often as consumers, we say, hey, you know, somebody I know redesigned their house. Let me see if they can recommend their contractor or interior designer or their carpenters. And you know, usually you go after word of mouth. On the worker side, there's um, you know huge issues that they have. As a consumer, you say, "Hey, I'll give you 10% advance or 20% advance," but they still have to buy all of the material, and they buy that on credit. And the longer they wait, the more interest sort of racks up. So credit to purchase material is really, really a problem there. If you're looking at an online solution or technology that connects consumers and buyers, where does that credit come from? Second, people are sort of, uh, the sellers or the workers, sorry, the workers are reluctant to buy material that they can't physically verify. Um, you know, they don't actively buy things online because they're worried they can't physically verify the authenticity of the product. And finally, um, you know, whenever they do a construction, they anticipate that they're going to need 50 screws. But what they actually need is maybe 30 screws. So what do they do with the remaining uh, inventory? What if the screws they bought weren't, wasn't good quality as they start screwing it in, it starts to rip apart, they need the ability to return. So if you were a technology solution, Craft Co., and you're trying to pull together consumers who want to redesign their spaces with the workers. And you're trying to build a platform that connects the two. What would you put in as, you know, customer benefits that you would measure? Um, in the interest of time, Kavi, I'm thinking, um, do we split right now or do we, uh, what would you recommend? How much time do we have? minutes i think and uh, vishal can you confirm that yeah we have 30 minutes left okay. so yeah so what we could do is we can break out into two teams uh, vishal because there's about 53 people It'd be very hard to do it all together i hope you are able to complete your activity kavita yes i think most people managed to map out the customer benefits does anybody want to share want to talk
we have a few more minutes, five to seven minutes. Does anybody want to talk about any challenges that kind of came up? Yeah, in our in our conversation, at least I felt that uh, we uh, at least I started with certain um, intuition, but over a period of time, by observing other, I also had to re rethought about my thought. So okay. I also course corrected myself about the customer benefits. So uh, that's all. What did you learn? Like, what did you learn, Chandan? Like, what was your before? Like, how were you doing it before, and how did you have to course correct? In in my mind, uh, in India business, everything is kitna deti hai. It's all about cost, but it, it mm. is not the case. Like, it was my first impression, but mm. over a period of time, when I interacted with many other of my um, Uh, colleagues they also mm-hmm. bring into a new dimension which also could be a customer value so then i realized yeah aha, yeah that could be also re- need to look into so even deepa also explained that okay it at at apparently at surface level we always think like that but when you grow deeper then mm-hmm. some other dimension comes out which also need to be looked into in our proposition so Absolutely. that is something wow moment yeah yeah and while that still translates into business benefit at the end of the day mm-hmm. right but that all mm-hmm. but it really it's about solving a need for yeah the end user which means yeah. higher uptake resulting mm-hmm. in better mm-hmm. business yeah yeah i felt value in a conversation and uh, debating and then think different because that confirmation bias which is actually taken over my thoughts but mm-hmm. while conversation with my fellow colleagues they also influence my thinking then i could able to course correct my thinking which which helped okay yeah. that is great and that's it's thank you for sharing it's i know it's not easy yeah. to share also but it's i'm sure it's insightful for others when they hear from yeah. you yeah yeah um i think for me uh, it was a good refresher to um uh, think about and uh, articulate customer benefit um because what happens is over a period of time we are so engrossed in understanding what the business wants uh, what do we want to achieve what is our goal uh, that even when we want to think from the customer's perspective we kind of think we have the authority to um understand what they need so maybe even we are talking about customer benefit but we think what benefit should we give them and when we think like that it's it's like so if we look at this example i should think like a designer uh, if i'm writing that down because currently i did not have like end users to interview so even if i have to write it on my own i really have to think like a designer and not being uh, like an it professional okay what can a designer really need Then. maybe this is what they need so having that distinction in the mind is is very important to have that awareness uh which which these kind of exercises um kind of uh, polish you through maybe which gets rusted over a period of time when you think about business too much right yeah thank you priya i think really it's about putting yourself in the customer shoes and to be able to do that it's also connecting with your customer right so you really know what what yeah. that uh, pain is yes just to paraphrase what priya just said uh, i think one is to consciously remain in the problem space and not jump into the solution space right while you're exploring what yes. you're trying to do and then uh, so it's again um, re- reemphasizing outcomes over output right what really matters uh, you want to measure that rather than any other metric so one is identification of the opportunity uh, which is desirably uh, you know capability of your system for the end user and then of course the metric when you come to the metric not look at the metric from uh, any inward view maybe from a view that means something to business right like an outcome thank you absolutely thank you thank you for saying what you said bankar and something that we constantly talk about is it's it's one thing to have the inside out view uh, and that's usually a very narrow perspective um typically uh, but also to get complement that with the out you so really learn mm-hmm. about what customers um are thinking about you but also understanding those evolving needs constantly because a customers need to stay and over and evolve to remain open to changes also and adapt Yes, I think there is a one more comment from Sonia. Like, also got me thinking about customer loyalty. That would happen if we are able to deliver emotional value to our customers. Thanks, Sonia, for yeah. sharing. Thanks, everyone. And yes, it's about unlearning what you have learned, true, yeah. uh, and that goes back to our confirmation bias.
thank you everybody we had a great time interacting with all of you and yeah. thank you for being such wonderful participants and for um, you know engaging and interacting with us it's always nice when we get responses so this was really fun for us too